All right, here we go. Boom, there it is. This is all the types in this project. Every single type is a dot, and all the lines connecting those dots are the relationships between types. So we can go up to this list here and see all the different kinds of relations, and actually we can even click none, and it's gonna like fan out like that. And you know, sure enough, if you click on one of these random dots, like every single one of these is a type somewhere in your project, right? And so I can bring back, uh, let's just bring back union, for example, and we can see like, oh, look at that. There's like this tuft in the middle that's centered around here. And if you know TypeScript well, you might be able to guess what this is. Like what's something that's in a lot of unions? Would you like to guess? All right, let's go look. Undefined, sure enough. So undefined, you do like string or undefined. So anyway, this is so much fun. You can get stuck, you know, like looking through this and seeing all the different things. But what is this for? This is for TypeScript performance benchmarking, finding problems in your TypeScript projects. There's lots of things when you get into a company that has a big set of monorepos with all these different things going on, or you have a big project with a lot of types, and you want to understand why it's slow in your editor or why it's slow on your CI, it is very difficult to do that. So in the past, the way that it worked is you would have these raw data files that you would get these trace.json and types.json files. And it's literally hundreds of megabytes of this kind of like wall of JSON text. And it's very useful if you know exactly how to use it, but it's like pretty much opaque to most people, including me. And I had to learn a lot about how to do this stuff in order to make that Doom and TypeScript types project happen. So for the last two weeks, I've been working really hard on making this, TypeSlayer, and I wanna take everything that I learned about how to do TypeScript performance benchmarking and put it into a tool. So we saw all those nodes. I'm gonna show you a couple different projects. So actually this one here is the React query project. So I did this off screen right before we started, but the idea for the UX for this is you go to some package and you type npx type slayer and this UI shows up. It's a Tauri app, so it's actually built in Rust and all the backend stuff is, is running in Rust. So imagine you're in a situation where you wanna learn more about your project and what's going on. This view here, award winners, tells you a lot of information about different kind of trivia you could think of about your project. So the largest union in this project has 935 members. That might sound like a lot, but actually you can get up into like the tens of thousands without a lot of trouble. And I think you don't get an error until about 100,000. But some projects have limits like way past 100,000. I mean, they may not realize it, or I've seen projects that they're at like 99,000 or something, and it's really, really slow because they haven't hit the limit yet, so they don't know where the problem is. So that's the point of this, is that you can get a little more insight. You can also go the other direction. You can say, like we just showed in the graph a minute ago, like what is the thing that is a part of the most unions? And so undefined, of course, takes the cake there. But another view here that you have is this tree map view. So in React Query, where I ran this, the most time was spent, 16% of the time was spent on this file, useQuery.test.tsx. And that in itself might be interesting information because I ran it against the prod, the, you know, the production tsconfig, tsconfig.prod.json. And some projects don't intend to be like checking the production build against the tests. Like you want to like think of your tests as being separate for the sake of production build. And I don't know, maybe they, I have to ask, I'll have to ask Tanner or TK Dota, like maybe they don't know that, you know, the test files here. Some projects do intend to do this because they consider it important for part of the release. Well, what I can do is I can copy that by clicking on it and I can go over here to Profetto. So Profetto is a tool, you can go to it on ui.profetto.dev, but you know, because we have all the power of a Tauri app, I was able to bundle it in here. And we can just go to that span here and see like what's all the stuff that's going on for the type checking of this particular file. And so you get into this situation where you have these types like this one here that you get out, you see source ID and target ID. These numbers here are IDs of types. Well, what are you gonna do with that information? You know, what you do with it is you're intended to go to this types.json file. They all have IDs going like kind of monotonically down. You're gonna search for it. But what I did is I built a thing that you can just enter that thing here so you can see it and you know look at this one look how much stuff is here and then at the bottom i put like the original re representation beautiful so like this is all you see in the json view you see t there's two type arguments and uh you know and some instantiation type but like that's all you get but actually if you unwind all of that stuff if i you know if i come up here and i collapse these fields we're gonna see that there's these two type arguments and one instantiated type you see but what TypeSlayer does is it unwinds all of that stuff and it shows you so you can really see. And what's cool about this is that all these paths here are clickable. So I could click on the first declaration for the, whatever this is, query, observer, refetch, error, result. Okay, great. So I can click on it and it's gonna take me to that spot in the file where this was created and I can see. So this way I can kind of back up. That's information that you don't get otherwise if you just look at Perfetto. All right. Another thing that we added here, or I added, I guess, it's just been me for the last two weeks working pretty hard on this, 
is uh, this speed scope thing. So speed scope is uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about it. It's for CPU benchmarking. So if you want to see the time that, you know, your CPU is really spending, this is kind of like if you attached a node debugger to a node process and like dropped it into Chrome or V8 profiling. And uh, this is what you would see. So for people who know what this is, this is very exciting because this is, uh, you know, another thing that's easy to have. I also built into this an MCP server. I'll admit this part is a little half baked, but it does work. And the idea here is that you can just go to a project and you can say, hey, do I have any, you know, I, I put a couple things in here just to kind of prove out the concept, but anything that you see in the award winners, we would be able to do. So I'll be able, we'll show you in a second, uh, but we're going to, uh, let's, and let's actually take a second and open up a project that's a little bigger. So this was React Query. I'm going to now open for you Signal. So let's go over here, you know, Signal, the Signal desktop client. So I'm here in the Signal project. I'm going to say NPX type slay ya. Uh. So then that's going to open this and we auto detected the package that we're in and all the stuff that we have. So, so let's run this. All right. So I'll talk you through what happens when you actually run the diagnostics. Okay. So this is like sight unseen. I just opened it fresh. Here it is. Identify types is basically the same as the generate trace stuff that you may have done if you've done any types of performance work in the past, but there's a lot of configuring that has to happen. Actually, while it's running, I'll show you that I give you examples of all the stuff that you have to kind of set up in the background. And it's like, I think, extremely configurable, perhaps too configurable at this point. So if there's something specific about your project, this is a thing that I'm worried about because uh, I'll show you in a moment. But a lot of projects have different ways that they, you know, use TypeScript. So that's the generate trace part. The next part is basically the same thing over again, but this time with the generate CPU profile. Then on the bottom in this little third module here underneath the one that's running right now is Analyze Trace. There's a tool called Analyze Trace that the TypeScript team made many years ago, but it hasn't been maintained for a few years. And there was a couple things that I saw in the code base that I wanted to make better. So I rewrote it in JavaScript. And then when I moved this all to Towery uh, last week, I rewrote it in Rust. And there are things in there that you just can't see otherwise. And we'll talk about those in a second. The last piece here is the type graph. So that's taking all the pieces that came before putting it together, creating a list of all the linkages and relationships between different things. All right, I'll speed it up here. Let's let this finish. All right, here we go. It's a big one. So we see here it's much bigger. This one has 500,000 types, 700,000 relationships between those types. We see some kind of similarities and some similar patterns. Don't think too much about this, but what I want to show you is some other things that this project has going on. So the React query types didn't have a lot. That was wrong, actually. They're really well maintained. But for example here, this has duplicate packages. So what is duplicate packages? What this is, is like, let's say Typefest, for example, is a good example. Okay, so like Typefest has been included at version 2.19.0 and version 4.26.1 in the bundle of this thing. So like when TypeScript needs to do its work, basically what happens is usually you have like a dependency of a dependency that is requiring different versions of the same thing. And what you can do is you can go into those packages and you can use, there's this thing, PNPMY. So I could say here, let's open a new thing. I'll say PNPMY type fest. And so it's going to give me the reason. You can also just look at the lock file, but it's going to give me the reason. And right away you can see like, okay, storybook is including type fest 2.19.0. And, you know, we could see other projects like ESLint is including 0.20.2. Okay. So like, there's different versions here being included. And if those are big packages, so like not to throw any shade, but like, I don't know, OctoKit, the Datadog types, the AWS CLI types, there are packages that have very intense TypeScript like requirements and workloads, and you're going to suffer that pain multiple times. And actually, one of the things here, I don't know, I'm not, again, no shade to the Signal people, Signal's cool, but like they may not realize that they have multiple versions of something that's internal to their project. It's probably just in some example somewhere that they forgot to update, but like, in order to type check the root project, TypeScript has to go through and do all that work twice. So usually when you look at projects, it's like duplicates of the Lodash types or something like that. All right. I do want to show you this. That's really cool. So this project has no hotspots in terms of like where time is being spent for different files. You can see like this is a really nice looking tree map. Let's look at something where there's a problem. This is a project that I made that like, you know, I just did some TypeScript tomfoolery, right? I'm just going to say NPX type Slayer. And we're going to see. So this is it's a one file project, right? So you could think how bad could it really be? I'm going to click run diagnostics. Let's let's get it nice and big here. So this project has a problem. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, look at that. Does anything look weird to you? Um, yeah, this is what it looks like. So if you have a project with a super large union, this is what you see. 
And it's pretty glaringly obvious, I think, from like a thousand mile view away what's happening and what's going on. So you can see the red, red is union and you could dig deeper, but you could also just go to award winners here and you could see, OK, look, there's a union that has 65,000 members and like it's calculating out all of the different members of that union. Right. So you can see them and let's do something more realistic. OK, because that that little example I did here is I like obviously contrived, but I want to show you something really important that's like huge for people who are maintaining complex projects or large monorepos. So I'm going to say MPX type Slayer here in the background and I will come back to it. So this is a kind of example of something that you might con you know, conceivably have in your code base. So like I have a list of colors here. I have a type for those colors and then I create a palette. A palette is just like a dash separated of two colors. And I can create a full palette, which is like a light mode and a dark, mo dark mode version. OK, so this is like not that contrived. This is something that you might have seen in your projects. And this could be like you're generating types for the eight paths on your API or something. Right. But like people do this kind of thing a lot. So if I use it, there's no problem. I see like red dash blue and yellow dash green. Those are my types like that just might be some way that I encode this information. But what might happen next? Like so imagine a developer comes along and they make this function that takes in one of these things that I call Z here, this light dark palette. Well, what they might do here is they might get this problem where they see this error. Expression produces a union that is too complex to represent TS2590. I think we all know what usually happens next. What usually happens next is they TS expect error this thing and it goes away. And something I really have to stress that I think is a big misunderstanding about TypeScript performance problems. This is still a performance problem because all you do with TS expect error is bury the diagnostic. You, you get rid of the red squiggly, but you don't actually say, do anything to save the problem that's you know, occurring under the hood. And so if we go here to huge union, you know, it doesn't look it lo doesn't look that intense. There's this thing here. Green we can see is intersection. So there's some like intersected type. But what we can see is a lot clearer if we go here and we go down to these type level limits. Type level limits are very important because they are errors that exist in your code base that you have no other way to find out about. So imagine that I'm, you know, in some big mono repo with a thousand packages and I put up my PR and my managers like barking, barking down my door to say, like, you know, you got to get this thing out and I get this error. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what I should do instead. But you get enough of those in a large project and it can be really, really complicated to figure out where they're actually even coming from and why things are slow. Well, this tool tells you about those things. So it sees through the TS expect error and it shows you, hey, you have one instance of this thing. So the error is actually under the hood called a cross product union, which makes sense if you think about it. And it gives you this error. So there are a couple of these like you may have seen others of these like type instantiation is excessively deep and possibly infinite. You have uh, here. Let's see. There's there's a couple here. Um, the containing function or module body is too large for control flow analysis. So they're, they're kind of funny to read some of them. And I tried to write up a little description about my best understanding of what these actually mean. Some of them, though, are kind of interesting because they will actually change behavior. So this one discrimination limit type related to discriminated type situation. When TypeScript gets into this pickle, it goes, all right, we've been working here for a while. It's been a long time. I think we're just going to say false like we there. We're doing a subtype analysis and we're just going to say, no, these two types cannot be assigned to each other. Just forget about it. We've already been down this path, but we'll say false. Although the answer might have been true. And so the actual like runtime behavior of your type will be different just because you hit this limit. And worst part, in this case, this one doesn't actually surface an error. So it does recreate a diagnostic that I can read from those wall of text JSON files. But it's not something that produces an error that you would see in like this TS2590 situation. So this is huge news. If you're a part of a large mono repo, you can run this on packages in your repo and see if there's situations going on. OK, what's next for this project? So if you go right now on December 10th and you type NPX type Slayer, you're going to be presented with this screen. The reason is, is because it's like not been tested at all. This has been like really has been the last two weeks. I need to know like what the what the rough edges are. I'm nervous about putting this in front of people and they like, oh, I want to see this pretty graph for my code base and like, let's pull it up. So message me on Discord if you have if you'd like a key, I'll give it to you in, in about a week. Probably I would say it'll probably be ready. So. I just didn't want to wait. I wanted to just get this tool out there and I didn't want to wait. I wanted to record this demo really quick for you. So I decided it was better this way than waiting one more week to get it out. And that way, people who have fancy projects with fancy TypeScript stuff can tell me what works and what doesn't work for them. Another thing is that monorepo support right now, TypeSlayer is per package and that's by design. I'm just like trying to keep it really simple and keep the scope small so that we can have something that's workable. 
In large monorepos, you could have even a thousand packages is not unheard of. And you're not going to go to each of those packages and run this individually. I'm, I'm definitely aware of that. And that's something that I'll do if this is something that people find to be useful. Another thing that is left remaining to do is MCP support. So I'll show you that on our way out here. We're kind of walking out the door so I can see, I can come over here and I can say like, are there, oh, first I have to start it actually. So you go to list servers, type Slayer, start server. Okay, so are there any hot spots in my, look at that, it's a VS Code bug. You see that, it's keeping the placeholder text. Funny things. Are there any hot spots in my project? Um, all right, let's hit enter. I hit enter, is it doing anything? Wow, look at that. If I have any bugs, I'm just gonna feel, I'm gonna feel so vindicated that like, oh, but the, but VS Code has bugs. Um, are there any hot spots in my project? There, now it worked. <laughs> That's funny. So let's see, it's gonna ask you this. Do you wanna, are you gonna be okay if I ask the type Slayer MPC server? And it'll say yes, and it's gonna say, yeah, there's these hot spots in your project. And of course that corresponds immediately to the same thing that you see in the UI. But the point of this is that once you start to expose enough stuff to the MCP server, you can start to say like, hey, go take Type Slayer, run it on this package, and tell me if there's anything you see, anything you find. And then like by that point, it should be easy. I completely understand that not everybody wants to do the work. And then, uh, you know, going through the, all the metrics and trying to understand it all. So AIs are very good at a part of this that is totally out of scope for Type Slayer. So the last thing I want to say is that on the topic of AI, AI is going to be very helpful for determining how to fix the problem. Type Slayer is going to be very helpful for telling you where the problem is. And that's really where I drew the line in the sand. I, I don't want this to become a tool about like fixing complex type foo stuff. If you're a wizard or not, uh, there's going to be a way that you can get help if you know where to look. But the whole problem is a lot of people don't do stuff like this because they don't know where to look. And this is the most encouraging thing I can tell you about this tool. I can almost guarantee you, if you work at a large enough company or you have a big enough project, there are performance problems that you can shave like a uh, hundred seconds off of your CI. That's a real story, by the way, by making a five line change. But the problem is like knowing where to make that change. So if you're like want to rise the ranks at your company and you want to be a hero among your friends at, at work, it's a really great thing to employ because Mo nobody looks at this like nobody you could have problems that were there for a year nobody would know everybody just suffers and they have a slow server while they're editing in their editor and they just don't know what to do and they can't fix it in and everything just feels slow but it doesn't have to be that way and i think the visibility that this tool provides is the point not actually how to fix it so my my dream going forward is that we add more mcp support type slayer can tell you where the problem is the ai can talk to you more about how to fix it then you can put type slayer back in the loop rerun all the, the diagnostics and see, did I fix my problem? So all of this together makes for a pretty nice little dev loop. All right, so that's it. That's Type Slayer. I hope you enjoy. Like I said, in about a week or something like that, we'll unveil the covers and take away the auth gate. It's just that there are so many ways to configure TypeScript projects that can break this generate trace pipeline. There's composite projects, incremental mode, uh, people storing their TS configs way off and who knows where. There's build mode. So there's lots of things that go on, people stacking them and, you know, using NX and Turbo Repo to figure it out. So I just want to make sure that all of that stuff works. I don't want people to have an experience where they do NPX type Slayer for the first time and then they pull it up and just like doesn't work because, you know, that's the entry point. It needs to be able to generate the files. So that's type Slayer brought to you by the power of WebGL and Rust <laughs> of all things. I'll be here just, uh, you know, clicking around trying to see what all these like, what is this guy here? We got uh, uh, HTML element event map. Okay, very interesting. Hmm, let's see what this one's all about. Yeah, see, this is what it's like. All right, bye. <laughs>